my great pleasure to introduce Professor Christine Lubich from University of Tübingen. Tübingen, Tübingen, yeah. Tübingen yeah. And Professor Lubich is an international leader in network analysis and computing. He made, made a fundamental contribution in uh, geometric integrator and many other air quantum physics, computational quantum physics, and uh, many body problems. And he received his PhD from in 1983, right? That's true, yeah. And I think some of the students here are not born yet. <laughs> yeah, maybe more than half here. Yeah, anyway, in 1983 from University of uh, Innsbruck. And uh, he, was, he was a planner speaker in the International Conference of Mathematicians in 2018. Yeah, so today, well, yeah, well, I will. I will tell about it. Okay, tell. today he'll give some a talk for for yeah we'll see. on geometric flows. Yeah, ah, geometric flows. Okay. okay. So, so thank you, Eiju, for the kind introduction and for the invitation to speak here. Uh, my talk today will be about numerical methods for computing geometric flows and about the analysis, convergence analysis of uh, such methods. And before I begin with the talk proper, uh, I would just like to show you a video which somehow illustrates the kind of things that we can compute with the methods about which we will tell you afterwards. So what we consider here is a model for tumor growth. Uh, there is a surface on which reactions are going on. There are two reactants. Uh, one of them is shown, uh, is, uh, the color coding is the concentration of one of the reactants uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, the other one is not shown here. Uh, the surface itself is not fixed because as the uh, chemical reactions on the surface go on, they <coughs> uh, change the surface itself. So there's a motion of the surface induced by the reactions on, on the surface and also by the mean curvature on the, uh, on the surface. On the right-hand side, uh, you know, well, you see these many needles. These just represent the normal vector. Well, we start here from a ball configuration, so the normal vector is just like a hedgehog uh, going out uh, side. And the color coding on the right hand side is the mean curvature, which changes with time. And now with this video, let me run it through. So what you see, the concentrations change and also the shape changes. <clears throat> and well, just, just once more. So the question then is, with which methods can you, this, can you uh, compute this and can you get a device methods for which you get guaranteed convergence as the mesh uh, uh, is refined? So this will be the topic of my talk. And now after this introductory video, let me get to the talk. So I will talk to you about convergent evolving surface finite element algorithms. So these are the kinds of method, methods that I want to study here uh, to be used for doing computations uh, for geometric uh, evolution equations, computing <coughs> moving surfaces uh, as I just uh, showed you, possibly coupled to other equations. And this is joint work with Balash Kovac, who was a postdoc with me in uh, Tübingen, and he's now at the University of Regensburg in Germany, and uh, with Bu Yang Li, uh, who is uh, at the Polytechnic University in Hong Kong, and who at the time uh, when we began this work uh, was also a Humboldt Fellow uh, for, for a year in Tübingen. So. Now, the outline is very short. Uh, I will give you an introduction about what kinds of problems we consider here. 
Uh, this will be first done in an informal way, but then to do it, get some rigor into it, I must explain some notions and introduce the necessary notation. And then I will mainly concentrate on a particular geometric flow uh, known as mean curvature flow. And we'll tell you about its discretization and convergence and end uh, with some numerical experiments. And that's the program of my talk. So, what does this mean curvature flow? You have a, imagine a two-dimensional closed surface. And to describe the motion of the surface, uh, you need to prescribe the normal velocity with which it moves at every point on the surface. And mean curvature flow says that this normal velocity should be equal to the negative mean curvature. So the mean curvature is the sum of the principal curvature of the two principal curvatures uh, on the surface. And <clears throat> so the equation here is very simple. It's V which is the normal velocity equals to the negative mean curvature, and the mean curvature will always be denoted by capital H. And this is a prime example of geometric evolution equations just in a way like the heat equation is a prime example of parabolic uh, partial differential equations. And we will see that actually there is some relationship uh, to the heat equation there, but there are many differences. And uh, I've uh, here a citation from uh, a review paper by S Steve White, who is one of the pioneers in the anal analysis of such geometric evolution equations, who says, there are many processes by which a curve or surface can evolve. But among them, one is arguably the most natural, the mean curvature flow. And the mean curvature flow is definitely the one about most analysis has been done, uh, so very much is known about this, and it's also best understood uh, from the uh, computational viewpoint. But there are many other of interest, but just to stick with first with this uh, mean curvature flow, let me uh, give you an example of how does a dumbbell-shaped uh, surface move under mean curvature flow. Uh, so here, see, in this region, uh, well, there's one negative curvature, which uh, principal curvature, and the other one is a, is a very large uh, positive curvature. So the mean curvature in this case would be uh, positive, and it would get more and more positive the thinner uh, this is. And so the motion works uh, moves in the direction of the negative mean curvature. Uh, so, uh, well, with respect to the outward normal, so it moves inside here at this, and finally reaches a singularity close, uh, uh, close to this time here. Before the time, the motion is smooth, and then you run into a singularity, uh, which is of this pinch type, uh, where the, uh, the surface separates. My interest uh, well, the analysis that uh, we'll do for the numerical method with which this has been computed refers to the case where we still have a smooth solution, so say up to this point or that point. Uh, our analysis does not cover singularities like that. That would be also interesting to do, but we will not, we're not yet at that, that point. Now, so much of my talk will be about uh, main, mean curvature flows, but I want to emphasize that the techniques that I present to you apply to a variety of uh, geometric uh, flows. One is forced mean curvature flow, which is actually, uh, of which an example is this tumor growth model that I showed you in the video at the beginning, where the normal velocity is the negative mean curvature, as in mean curvature flow, but then you have extra forcing terms, which are here this uh, some coefficients times u1 and u2, and u1 and u2 solve a, sol solve a system of reaction diffusions on the evol evolving surface. So here the motion of the surface is coupled to a, a reaction diffusion on the surface itself. And this 
<coughs> video that I showed you refers to exactly such a, such a uh, model. Another example is Gaussian curvature flow, where the normal velocity is the negative Gaussian curvature. Now, the Gaussian curvature is the product of the two uh, uh, principal curvatures. Uh, and this has uh, quite different effects. It is used as a model for grinding sto stones. If you go at the beach, you often see these round, round stones. This comes fr from grinding, and this is modeled by, uh, by uh, Gaussian curvature flow. So these lead to second order partial differential equations. But then there are also models that require fourth order partial differential equation. So why fourth order? The mean curvature itself is the second derivative of positions. So curvature this adds two derivatives. And now it's the Laplacian. So it's, this gives a fourth order differential equation. And this, uh, this is a model for crystal growth and many other things. And uh, Professor Bao uh, uh, has done important work uh, uh, in the, uh, the uh, computations of uh, uh, surface diffusion flow. And the quite related model is Wilmer flow, which is like surface diffusion flow, but, but, but has an extra uh, forcing term. And this is the L2 gradient flow for the elastic bending energy. And this is an important model in biomembranes and similar things. Uh, well, here's just an example of uh, surface evolutions uh, uh, under, uh, under Wilmer flow. So we start here with an ellipsoid. Well, what would, do, would the mean curvature uh, flow do with an, uh, if we start from an ellipsoid? It would reduce the size. It would reduce the size and take it to something which asymptotically uh, is a ball. So as time goes on, up to a finite time, where, where everything collapses, uh, <clears throat> mean curvature flow would uh, uh, get an, uh, would uh, move, would change this. Starting from a ellipsoid, it would change it into something that is asymptotically a ball that gets smaller and smaller. This is different with Wilmer flow. It also moves the ellipsoid into a ball but of a, of a finite size. So it doesn't reduce the size. Oops. Uh, and here are three initial surfaces. One is like a, a red blood cell. Uh, this also moves into a circle. And here we start with a tor uh, some tor toroidal uh, shape. And this moves into a torus with a particular ratio between the radii of the two tori, the so-called Clifford torus. And uh, well, here we have shown the elastic en uh, energy. And uh, <coughs> since it's uh, uh, the gradient flow, this, uh, this goes down. And the numerical method uh, does that too. So these were just some examples of geometric flows, which we can uh, address with our computational techniques and also with our uh, numerical analysis for the methods that we have used. And now let me here give the summary of my talk. We have these surface flows and we want to approximate them. And the way we'll do it is to use finite elements which evolve on the surface. So the nodes of the finite elements evolve on the surface. But at the same time, the, no the evolving nodes determine the surface just by uh, interpolation. And so we must discretize the velocity equation. Uh, well, the velocity uh, will, in my talk, will be taken uh, as just pointing to the normal direction, though in some cases there are good reasons to add some tangential directions to get better meshes. Uh, and we will just take this velocity equation and interpolate it onto the finite element space. And this is coupled with parabolic evolution equations, nonlinear parabolic evolution equations for auxiliary geometric quantities. And in the cases 
of, uh, well, in all cases except the Gaussian curvature flow, uh, it's the normal vector and mean curvature for which we derive parabolic evolution equations and see how these quantities evolve under the surface flow. And by combining these two equations, we get methods which, for which we can prove that they converge and even converge with optimal rates. So with this approach, by adding these extra evolution equations for auxiliary geometric quantities, we get provably convergent numerical methods with optimal order H1 error bounds as long as, as the exact surface uh, is smooth. So this can uh, <clears throat> only go up to a thing, uh, to a, when it hits a singularity, then our analysis no longer applies. But as long as we have s smooth surfaces, uh, we can uh, get uh, convergence, or optimal order convergence results by such an approach. A new is the normal vector. New is the outer normal. Uh, sorry. Uh, new is the outer normal, and H is the mean curvature. Yeah. We, we add uh, differential equations for these quantities, and I think that that was, in a way, uh, what was new. What we uh, uh, that we introduced this into numerical analysis. Uh, it had been used by analysts before for analyzing properties of the mean curvature flow, but uh, apparently we were the first to use this uh, in in a numerical context and. Uh, the, the, since we de then deal with well-posed evolution equations, uh, this uh, allows us to obtain a stable, uh, guaranteed stable and convergent numerical methods. And here are a number of papers for different mean curvature flow, forced mean curvature flow, Wilmer flow, surface diffusion flow, generalized mean curvature flows where we would have powers of the mean curvature, uh, particularly inverse mean curvature, so where we would F1 over the mean curvature. Uh, there has also been work by uh, Balash Kovac and uh, his co-author uh, about mean curvature flows in higher co-dimensions, and we are currently working on Gaussian uh, curvature flow. Gaussian curvature flow is different in there. It, it's not sufficient just to take the normal vector and mean curvature. Instead of mean curvature, one must take the full uh, second uh, normal, normal form and uh, derive uh, equations for that. And that makes things a bit more complicated. But in most of, I mean, in 45 minutes, I cannot tell you about all that. So I will concentrate on the simplest example, which is mean curvature flow, and illustrate you the basic ideas and techniques there. Sorry? OK. <clears throat> so now let me begin with some basic notions and the corresponding notation. So we are interested in computing evolving surfaces. And such an evolving surface is denoted by gamma at time t. So that's the surface at time t. And it is described by a flow map, uh, x of p and t, where p is a point on the initial surface. So in a way, you can view this as a parameterization of the surface at time t by the initial, uh, by the initial surface. And we assume that this flow map is as regular as we need. <clears throat> and uh, well, what makes it a flow map is that at time zero, x of p is just this point p on the initial surface. Actually, for <clears throat> what we'll do uh, in the numerics, it's not convenient to think of this as a parameterization. Uh, it's more. <clears throat> For the intu intuition, it's more of thinking of x of p and t as the posi position at time t of a moving particle with label p. So you have your initial surface, this, which is built up of points. Think of these points as particles. Give, it to each, give a label to each of these particles, and then move these particles. And then collect the positions of all particles at a later time t. And this collection then gives the surface at a later time. 
And this is the intuition which will stand behind the numerical methods that we can choose. So there will never be an exp explicit parameterization of the, of the surface. Yeah? Gamma zero there, I discretize with a mesh. I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, yeah, well, I will put the finite element mesh on the initial surface. And then I will move the nodes of this initial, of this initial surface. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, thinking of uh, the moving surface as a collection of moving particles is a, uh, is, uh, appeals more to the intuition than saying it's a parameterization. Well, an important uh, uh, quantity uh, is the velocity, uh, which is just the time derivative of this flow map. So this gives the velocity of, of each particle, this where x and p are related, that x is the position of the particle p at time t. And then there's the material derivative, uh, which is just the total derivative of a uh, function u depending on uh, uh, <coughs> on the pos a position x uh, at p and t and t and you take, take the total derivative here and I denote this as the material derivative of u with this dot symbolizing a, a, a particle or a, a point uh, at at the point x, if x is again the uh, is again the point here, of, of course, to have this as a unique representation, I need to have an immersion or, or something like that. Okay, then I need <coughs> derivatives. So, so here we already have a derivative in time. So this this will be the type of uh, time derivatives with which we deal. But then we also need space derivatives. And the simplest one is the tangential gradient. So suppose you have a function u defined on the surface, which is real valued. Then the tangential gradient <coughs> is formed by, yeah, you can construct it in the following way, just extend u in a, uh, in a volume uh, around the surface, take the gradient there, and project the gradient to the tangent space. Uh, then one can show that this is independent of how this is extended to, to the volume, and this is the tangential gradient. Then by duality, you would get the surface divergence. And from the two, you get the Laplace Beltrami uh, operator, which is the surface divergence of the surface uh, <coughs> gradient. If you're not familiar with these quantities, just think of them as surface versions of the usual gradient divergence and Laplacian that you know. And all these are well defined on a regular surface uh, gamma. Now, we already had this. Uh, normal vector, so this gives a normal vector field defined on the surface, and I will always take the outer normal. So I will consider closed surfaces, and then I will take the outer normal. Then there's the Weingarten map, or uh, second uh, <coughs> fundamental form, which is determined well, the, which this determines curvature. What, what is curvature? Curvature shows how the the curvature is related to how the normal vector changes. That, that's what makes some, I mean, if the normal vector doesn't change, you have, a, you have no curvature, you have a, you have a plane. Uh, the changes of the normal curvature are measured by the tangential gradient of the uh, normal curvature, so uh, you th uh, which means that taking the normal, uh, uh, the, the, the surface gradient of each of the components of the normal curvature. So, and since you have three components, you get a three by three matrix, which turns out to be symmetric. And uh, this has three eigenvalues. One eigenvalue is zero, just because the normal 
vector is normalized by one, and so in the normal uh, direction it cannot choose, it cannot change. So this <coughs> gives an eigenvalue zero. And then there are two more eigenvalues, which are the principal curvatures of our surface. And then from these principal curvatures, you can form further quantities, which are of interest. One is the sum of the squares. This is just the squared Frobenius norm of A of X. Uh, so the sum of the squares of the entries and uh, due to the invariance of the Frobenius norm and the uh, orthogonal transformations, it's just the sum of the squares of the eigenvalues. So it's, it's, it's this. And what will be of most important to us is mean curvature, uh, which here is taken as the sum of the mean curvature. Uh, uh, sometimes, as also the name suggests, you take one half times. You, would take the, uh, you might take the arithmetic mean of both. And in the literature, this is not uh, uniform. Some use uh, it in this way, some use it in another way. Here, I just take this, the trace of the uh, Weingarten map. Uh, which is the sum of the two curvatures. So these are the notions uh, with which we have to work. And I hope it wasn't going too fast that you uh, couldn't follow the notation, because the notation will come up, uh, up here. So here is still simple. This is mean curvature flow in all its beauty. The normal velocity equals the negative mean curvature. It's a, it's a nice equation, isn't it? Uh, but just how do you discretize this? That's not, that's not so obvious. Uh, and there's a <coughs> decades long uh, history to uh, computational methods for mean curvature flow. Uh, there have been, the f I think the first one were level set methods uh, which, with which I will not uh, deal here, but uh, then the first uh, researcher who came up with finite element approximation of mean curvature flow was Gerd Juk, uh, who in 1990 proposed what would nowadays be called uh, an evolving surface finite element method. And our method has much in common with Juke's method, but some fundamental things are different. What, what is in common is that the moving nodes of a finite element mesh, so think of them, these nodes, as the particles, they determine the approximate evolving surface. So, as you uh, uh, indicate in the beginning, the initial surface uh, is triangulated by a finite number of points. These points are moved, and from these moving points, I, I, I get the surface at any later time. So, I think this was the first uh, method where this was done in, in such a way, uh, in Juke's method, and we also follow this uh, approach. But he uses a different, we will use a different formulation than he did for the equations that need to be solved uh, to, to move these nodes. And what he uses is a weak and very appealing formulation of mean curvature flow, which formally is very similar to the heat equation. Uh, this leads to a very elegant method, and I can come to that in a moment. But even today, after 33 years, there's no convergence results of Juke's method for closed two-dimensional surfaces. This has remained an open problem. The situation is different for curves. Already in 1994, so just a few years later, Juke could prove convergence of well, the curve analog of his uh, surface finite element method uh, for curves. For closed curves, everything has been known for a long time. Uh, also known is a, uh, is a different situation where you do not have a closed surface, but uh, a surface with a boundary, and uh, the surface is a graph. But the, the, the finite elements there are not, 
are not evolving surface finite element methods, but there it's really the height of the graph that you, uh, that is parameterized over a flat domain, and you use a finite element method to uh, compute the height of the graph. So that's of a different kind. Now, uh, take a sheet of paper, uh, bend it like, uh, then it's a graph over the, uh, over the plane. So it has a boundary. It's, it can be a closed surface. It's, it's an open surface. Think, think of a sheet of paper. It bent. And this is a graph over a flat surface. But for that method, the finite element method that was analyzed there by Declinic and Juk, uh, it's not it's not the move, the, the, the nodes of the finite element mesh that move. It's the, the finite element mesh is put, well, on the floor, so to speak, with fixed nodes. And then it's only the height of the graph, which is determined. So that, that's a different kind. And then there is another evolving finite element. There are other evolving finite element discretizations also without convergence result. Uh, by Barrett, Gark, and Nuremberg in 2008 and follow-up papers. But when I said there's no convergent result for Juke's method, <clears throat> that's right as in as far as Juke considered linear finite elements. Uh, there's also no convergent result for quadratic finite elements. There's no convergent result for <clears throat> finite elements of degree three. But in, a, in an amazing work, Bui Yang Li in 2021, two years ago, showed the convergence of Juke's finite element semi-discretization for finite element methods of sufficiently high polynomial degree, and he needed polynomial degree at least six. I mean, theoretically, that's a wonderful work. Practically, uh, you wouldn't like to, uh, to compute with polynomial degree six. But it's an amazing work, which also highlights the difficulties in, uh, in Juke's approach. This is not is not known. Now, what does Juke do? So, the velocity of the surface gamma. Uh, well, I, I previously I wrote gamma of t, but to indicate the uh, dependence on the flow map, I denoted as gamma of x. So, x would be the flow map, and gamma is the surface, uh, and the, the velocity is. The normal velocity is minus the mean curvature, and the velocity is the normal velocity times the normal, ve the normal vector. So I, there, there are no tangential components considered here, which wouldn't change the surface. <coughs> but uh, as I said, it might sometimes be useful to get uh, better distributed grids. Now, this equation can be rewritten in a way that looks formally like the heat equation. So the, no, the velocity is just the time derivative of the identity map on gamma. That's the left-hand side. And now it turns out that, min, that the minus the negative, uh, mean cur so the negative mean curvature times the normal vector can be written as the surface Laplacian applied to the identity map on gamma. And now this, formally look like the heat equation. You have a time derivative on the left-hand side. You have <coughs> a Laplacian <coughs> of the unknown on the right-hand side. And so, well, we know how to deal with the heat equation, don't we? <coughs> yeah, we do. Uh, but there's, there's a difficulty here. And the difficulty is that it, the surface Laplacian depends on the surface on which I am. And of course, the unknown x, the identity map on the gamma, always depends on the surface. And this makes this equation a non-parabolic equation. And that creates, uh, that creates the problems uh, and is the reason why up to this date, there is no convergent result for Juke's original method. And uh, so what Juke did, oh, sorry. What Juke did, he started from there. And then, since one knows how to deal with the heat equation, we would use a weak formulation of this, which is given here. 
So you just put the uh, divergence on the other side and you have this familiar bilinear form. <coughs> it looks very much like the heat equation then, so you get an equation for the velocity and then you uh, change uh, your positions according uh, to the given velocity. So that is the method proposed by Jock. Uh, well, then based on this weak formulation, he does a standard finite element method. Well, more or less, by now, standard uh, an evolving finite element method based on this formulation. Uh, this is very elegant. And uh, I do not know any math method that would be more elegant than this. But uh, yeah, there are, uh, there are uh, problems with the convergence. It seems to work well in many numerical examples, uh, but uh, the convergence theory uh, not, is not existence. Now let me describe the approach that we took. <clears throat> we start from the equation as it is. The velocity is the negative mean curvature times the normal vector. And we do not determine the mean velocity, uh, the, the mean curvature, and the normal vector from the surface at, an, at a particular time. But we use evolve, uh, evolution equations to get approximations to, the, uh, to these. And in the uh, literature on the analysis of mean curvature flow, the approach to take evolution equations for auxiliary geometric quantities has been very fruitful for studying questions of well-posedness and so on. And this goes back to Hüsken, 1984. Uh, just as an aside, I should mention Hüsken is a colleague of mine in Tübingen in the same building. I'm on the third floor, he's on the sixth floor. I've been in Tübingen since, since 1994, so we have been colleagues for nearly 30 years. But it took 25 years, and uh, the <coughs> intermediation by uh, my co-authors uh, from Hungary and from uh, Hong Kong uh, to <laughs> establish this connection that the work that Husken did might be useful to what we did. So there would have been a very short connection, something like uh, 50 meters, but uh, we had to cross half the globe and uh, used 25 years to, to come to the idea of using these equations for our purposes. So sometimes science is not, it's, it's not the shortest path that is always chosen. Yeah. <laughs> So, but now what we're doing, we are effectively discretizing Huskin's differential equations for mean curvature flow. And these equations are parabolic equations. So I need initial values for the normal vector and the uh, mean curvature, which either are given analytically or computed from the, from the given surface, approximate, approximately. And then these are evolved in, uh, in time according to parabolic equations. Now, these are true nonlinear parabolic equations. Uh, yeah. <coughs> you see, for, previously for the identity map, I told you you don't get, don't get parabolic equations here for these quantities. Uh, <coughs> they're well posed, they have some parabolic character. Uh, now, <coughs> we had the good luck to choose, well, here we have these two variables, and we just use them for them, so we have h and nu in our velocity law, and we use these two variables uh, for, the, uh, for the evolution equations. In, for other uh, geometric flows, you might need uh, uh, other geometric uh, quantities. So as I said, using such evolution equations has been the standard in the analysis of mean curvature flow since Huskin's pioneering work in the, uh, in the early 1980s. But it took uh, 25 years uh, to take, uh, no, no, more, uh, 35 years, 35 years to take this to, 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 to numerics. 
uh, which, again, another side shows that communication between neighboring communities, such as analysis and uh, numerical analysis, uh, there can, there's, there's room for improvement. <laughs> and, and it can be extremely helpful. Or here for us, it could have been extremely helpful because then I would have given this talk maybe 15 years, uh, 15 years earlier. Now what we do, we discretize the weak form of these equations. So the time derivative, we compute the flow map. The time derivative of the flow map is the velocity at the current positions, the velocity composed by the flow map. Then we have the velocity here is given by minus the mean curvature times the normal vector. And now h and nu are not computed directly from the surface, but they are computed by discretizing these evolution equations in, a weak, uh, in, in the weak form. And of course, to start here, I need initial data for the positions for the normal vector and the, uh, and the mean curvature. Flow. You might say this is not as elegant as Juke's method. You're right, Juke's method has an unbeatable elegance, but this leads to a provably convergent algorithm and even with optimal rates. Okay, so now let me come to the discretization. <clears throat> I already mentioned that what we do, we evolve the nodes of the mesh in time which gives us a nodal vector. So I compute the coordinates of all uh, nodes in a huge vector, x of, uh, a bold phase x of t. So which is uh, in, uh, so if I have n nodes, then this is a vector in R23n. And from these nodes, I define an approximate surface, essentially by interpolation. <coughs> some type of isoparametric finite element interpolation. Uh, but from the nodes, <clears throat> yeah, from on this surface, then I have, can define nodal basis functions, which are finite element functions that are, take the value one on one node and are zero on the others. And they span a finite element space on this discrete surface. And I can view the, this discrete surface also as the surface generated by a, an approximate uh, flow map, which it denotes capital XH. And then our evolving surface finite element method looks like that. Instead of the exact velocity, I take an approximate velocity. And this, all this is evaluated for the uh, approximate flow map, uh, then this VH, well, the velocity would be minus mean curvature times the normal vector. I don't have these available. Of course, I can form the products of the approximations, which approximations always carry this mesh parameter H uh, as a symbol. Uh, but the, the product is not a finite element uh, uh, method, so I take the finite element interpolation of that. In the original paper in 2019, we still used the Ritz projection here. We later found that uh, just finite element uh, interpolation is not only cheaper, but is sufficient to get a stable method here. But that was a later development. <clears throat> and then I discretized the evolution equations for the normal vector and mean curvature, starting from the weak form that I had on the previous slide. So this is the system that we solve in the discrete case. And of, so that, that would just correspond to a semi-discretization in space. And at the end, we discretize uh, this equ uh, these equations also in, uh, in time. <clears throat> but in this way, we get an approximation of the flow map by an approximate flow map of the velocity by an approximate velocity, and similarly for the normal vector and the mean curvature. <clears throat> and we have corresponding <clears throat> nodal vectors, which are denoted with these boldface uh, letters. 
Uh, I want to emphasize these nodal vectors. They will, uh, working with them is, will be useful, is useful if you just program the method. But it's also our stability analysis is based on a formulation uh, that uses the nodal vectors. And this, this formulation is given here. So the first equation is very simple. The time derivative of the nodal vectors is just the nodal vector of the velocities. Then the nodal vector of the velocity is just a pointwise product of the nodal vector of the entries of the nodal vector with the entries of the, uh, uh, of the normal vector. So this is a very, very direct. This is just element wise. But then you have equations uh, these uh, parabolic uh, equations for the normal vector and mean curvature flow, and they take the, they, they have a similar form, so let, let me take them together by creating an even larger vector. Uh, so this vector u contains the nodes, uh, nodal uh, values of the normal vectors of the approximations to the normal vector and the uh, mean curvature ve uh, vector, and m of x would be the mass matrix. Uh, which con uh, contains the integrals of products of basis functions on the surface defined by the nodal, nodal vector x. So you see we have here a state-dependent mass matrix and similar state-dependent uh, stiffness matrix, which contains the, gra uh, the products of the uh, gradients uh, of the surface gradients uh, of the uh, Basis, uh, basis functions. And then there's this nonlinearity, which summarily is just written here as an f of x and u. Now, Juke's method, if written in nodal form, is more elegant. It just has x dot equal v, and then, then it, it uh, just has the same mass matrix times v plus a of x times x equals zero. So this looks simpler, but actually computationally it's not much more expensive because the computationally expensive part is building the mass matrix and, uh, the, uh, and the stiffness matrices. That's the computationally expensive part. All the rest is comparatively uh, cheap, and these two ingredients are common in both methods. So computa computationally, uh, they are of similar, of similar cost. This is slightly more costly, but uh, uh, say uh, something uh, <coughs> for uh, e equal parameters, uh, maybe it's 20% uh, more costly. So uh, that's, that's negligible. But for this, we can prove stability. For this, we can't. It's really the problem of stability, uh, which makes it difficult for Juke's method and which can be handled here. Of course, then in the end, I have to uh, discretize also in time. What we use is a linearly implicit backward difference formula for discretization. I won't go into the details, uh, but we can go up to order five with this approach. Now, let me give the convergent result that we proved. So we assume that our surface is sufficiently regular on the considered time interval from zero to capital T. So I, I, need, I really need this high regularity if I want to get high order error bounds. Uh, we start from a quasi-uniform shape regular initial triangulation. So these are standard notions. Uh, I require that only of the initial triangulation and actually that these, pr these uh, our proof also shows that these properties are preserved, uh, provided that the steps uh, initially uh, that the step size is sufficiently small. We use finite elements of polynomial degree k, now not greater than six, as uh, in Buyang Li's method, but we need order two. For linear, uh, there's current work going on by, I know of current work by uh, Declinic and Kovac and also by Bu Yang Li, uh, who are addressing uh, the, the, the linear case, but nothing has been published yet on that. But there's ongoing work by them. 
I'll explain why we need a polynomial degree too. Uh, I also need a mild step size restriction uh, that the time step sh should be bounded by an arbitrary constant times uh, the, the mesh size. So the constant is arbitrary, but it has an effect on the constants in the error bounds. But it is not, it, it's, uh, otherwise it's, uh, it plays no bigger role. And in particular, there's no uh, restriction of the step size by h square, but only by h. And this, so <clears throat> this I consider a mild step size restriction. And of course, uh, if I start have a BDF method that's a multi-step method, I need sufficiently uh, accurate starting values. The constant, the constant is arbitrary, but independent of tau and h. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then we get optimal order error bounds. So h to the power k, k was the polynomial degree here. And q was the q step BDF, uh, again restricted for q between two and five. So I need the implicit Euler method or linearly implicit Euler method would not work. I also here I need at least order two. And for the BDF method, I can go up to order five because of some <coughs> stability issues. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> these bounds are valid in the H1 norm, not only for the positions, but also for the velocity and also for the normal vector and even for mean curvature. So I get the full order of convergence even for, uh, for the mean curvature, which is somewhat amazing. Right, I mean, what we evolve and use in our computation are not the exact normal surface, uh, norm, are not, is not the exact normal of our approximate surface, but it's some other quantity which is, which is evolved, and that, that makes it possible. Well, I can't give you the proof, but I want to make some remarks on the proof. What are the difficulties? Uh, one thing is we need to relate three different surfaces. One is the exact surface, here shown in gray. Then you can interpolate the uh, exact surface on the finite element mesh. But then the surface you compute is somewhere else. And there are two steps. What has been known for uh, yeah, at least for the last 15 years is how to relate the interpolated surface to the exact surface, if that is regular enough. There's work by Juke and Demlo and, uh, and others. But uh, to relate these, to relate the computed surface and interpolate surface, we add intermediate surfaces. So we, can, we add a continuum of surf finite element surfaces, which just uh, say if theta is one half, I would just take the uh, arith arithmetic mean of the uh, nodal vectors. And this defines another finite element surfaces. And now with theta, I can go between zero and one, and in this uh, way, have a continuum of surfaces. And working with these, this turns out to be uh, a key technical element. And this allows us to relate the computed surface with the exact surface in the end by uh, uh, considering all uh, these three surfaces first and then the intermediate surfaces uh, between the two finite element surfaces. Then another point is, in the end, we get estimates in the H1 norm. But the H1 norm is not sufficiently strong to control uh, <clears throat> the errors in uh, our unknowns, uh, which we need to control to get stability. And to do, the, to do this, I need to estimate not only in the H1 norm, which would be the W12 norm, but in the W1 infinity norm. And <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, I do, I, in the end, I only get error estimates in the H1 norm. So, but for a finite element surface, I can relate the two by inverse estimates. For these estimates, I need polynomials of degree at least two. Now the proof, I mean, the basic structure of proof is a very classic numerical analysis proof. We study consistency and stability, and from the two con uh, get convergence. So the problem is just doing the two. 
we're getting consistency and stability. Let me first, the harder part is stability. I think that that's where our novelty is because that's where Juk failed with his method. Consistency is there for both methods in a very similar way. Uh, by stability, I mean, stability uh, comes in many different shades in numerical analysis. What I here understand by stability is to bound the errors in terms of the defects that are obtained by inserting the projected exact solution into the method, method equations. So I didn't note the consistency error. I take, well, the, uh, the, the method equations work with finite element methods, so I project the exact method onto the finite element space. This might be by interpolation, but it's not always sufficient. Sometimes I need some kind of rich projections or even some refined rich projections. Uh, so, but this gives me a reference solution or model solution on the finite element uh, space on the interpolated surface. I can insert this into the finite element equations of the method. And here this nodal vector uh, representation is very useful because this I can do no matter on which surface I work. I always work in R to some higher power. And then I can insert it there and study the consistency errors in the norm, in norms that correspond to the uh, H1 norms of the moving surfaces. So in solution dependent norms. And this gives me defects which I can control from the consistency analysis. I start from the exact solution, project it, insert it into, into the method. It doesn't, uh, this projected solution doesn't satisfy the, the equ equation of the numerical method exactly, but up to a small defect which I can control. But then the hard part is to con is conclude from these defects to the errors in our numerical schemes. And that's what I call stability. <clears throat> and now, the surprising thing is the stability proof works with this matrix for, uh, vector formulation. And there's uh, this matrix vector formulation, you've thrown out all, all the geometry. So there's no geometric argument in the whole stability proof. This came as a surprise to us because ultimately the whole thing is a very, the geometry uh, of course enters into these consistency estimates. There's a lot of geometry there, but not in the stability. <clears throat> what we use is energy estimates in solution dependent norms. And, uh, well, in energy estimates, you test with a, uh, suitable functions, and here we just test with the time derivative of the error vector, or well, the discrete time derivative in the full, fully discrete case. And here we use some old results by Dahlquist and Nevelino and O'Day on uh, BDF formulas that come in very handy here. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the consistency bounds, they use geometric estimates, uh, and such, uh, Bounds have been derived earlier by Juke, by Demlo, and what, they, what wasn't done by them was finally done by my co-author, co uh, Balish Kovac. <clears throat> and then when you have consistency and stability, then it's rather quite easy uh, to get the convergence of optimal order. So that is how we proceed. But it's really the stability proof which is the hard work, and which leads to our paper having 50 pages. At the end, let me just give you a numerical experiment, again, for, uh, where I compare uh, Juke's algorithm on the uh, left with uh, the algorithm I described to you. But the algorithm I described to you doesn't use the fact that the normal vector should have length one. In fact, this can be incorporated in a way that also can be analyzed, but it wasn't, uh, as it described it so far, far. So on the right hand side, I also describe uh, essentially the same method, except that in a, in a suitable way, you normalize, you only, you, you only use the normalized normal vector in your equations. Uh, and this was the starting at time zero, we start from the surface. And then as time proceeds, uh, at the beginning, all three are working quite well. You see that they are not perfect. Uh, you may wonder why it's this horizontal line here in Juke's method. This appears also in the others, so with less degree. Here's some indentation, which maybe shouldn't be. 
which is, is better in the normalized one. So it isn't perfect, uh, but we just let it run without doing anything particular on the mesh. Uh, then as time proceeds, uh, here you see first wiggles in Juke's algorithm, which, whereas it works, looks as previously uh, for our approaches, and now, now, now things go get wrong. Uh, so at zero zero point zero point zero eight, we we get into the singularity. So we're very close in time to that point, and here Juke's algorithm gets unstable. And if we would go just a little further, it would, would just uh, blow up. Now, here's no blow up, but this has a strange form. And what happened is, because the normal vector, the curvature is fast, it, the normal vector get, uh, gets larger than one. And so, the normal vector faster than one, it speeds up the, uh, the, the, the velocity, uh, the, the motion. And here it has already passed across the singular point too early. And it passed, and after, after the singularity, it, uh, it, it, it develops a shape like this. So there's absolutely no analysis of that, uh, but that's what happens. On the other hand, with a normalized one, that still stays in time with a, with a solution as it wants. So normalization can have a big effect for the robustness near less regular situations. And now let's look at this normalized algorithm near the singularity. So you here see we are at 0 0.082, 0 0.031, 0 0.082813. So it gets thinner and thinner. Here we're at 0 0.0835. Uh, and it's amazing the <coughs> algorithm works very close to the pinch, uh, still very close to the pinch singularity. We absolutely have no theoretical explanation of that, but of course we are pleased to see that it does. So let me come to the conclusion. What I've told you here is was mainly concentrated on mean curvature flow, and we approximate it by evolving finite elements where we discretize the velocity law essentially as it stands, differently from what the juke does, by interpolation onto the finite element space. Then we solve parabolic evolution equations for geometric quantities, in our case, the normal vector and the mean curvature flow. Uh, and with this approach, we get convergence of optimal order in the, N1 or, uh, in the H1 norm. Of course, this H1 norm is a solution dependent, is, is, is a solution dependent, uh, surface dependent norm. The surface evolves, and so it's the H1 on the, uh, on the exact surface. And we get it not only for the position, but even for the, also for the velocity, for the normal vector, and even for mean curvature flow, we get the same optimal order error bounds, provided that the exact surface is smooth. This, this is, at the moment, basic for our theory. Of course, it would be nice to understand the behavior near singularities, but we are not at that point yet. But what I've told you for mean curvature flow extends to many extends to all the uh, equations that I uh, mentioned to you in the beginning, forced mean curvature flow, Gaussian curvature flow, surface diffusion flow, Wilmer flow. Uh, <clears throat> we have either already done it or there is ongoing, uh, ongoing work. Uh, so using these extra evolution equations has turned out as a key to obtaining convergence re results and methods which turn out to be quite robust in uh, the numerical experiments. But with that, let me close and thank you for your attention. Thank you.